Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, for more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. This is episode 28. We have gone seven months straight, seven months in a row that we have not missed a Monday when we decided to start doing these live streams. Um, This is absolutely crazy. And we're also approaching our two year anniversary. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Bob King. Bob, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. I'll be sending that out to you uh, in the next couple of days. Just reach out to me if I don't reach out to you first. Um, On our Jake's live stream, the next one we have will actually take place on the day we uploaded our first podcast episode. So we're going to have a big shindig for that with a couple of guests already lined up. Um, And then the the last thing is, as always with these Monday Night Lives, you ask a good question, you win a gift card. That's how this whole thing works. So for everyone that'll be listening in, ask your questions away in the comments section and we'll get to them as we go along here. And without further ado, we got to bring on the man, the myth, the legend, the guy that basically runs the, you know, the lake of Virginia, Billy Coles. Billy, how are you doing tonight, sir? Well, where is his screen? There it is. Are you there, bud? I'm there. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Have you been staying busy? Crazy busy, bro. We're about to do a baby move. Oh, right. Yeah. And and for people that don't know, is that something we can actually break on the show here? Uh Uh-oh. Looks like we're having some internet problems, which always happens at the worst time possible. I know. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. That's weird um we'll see if it gets worse or better um so yeah we're about to head out on a baby moon so i'm about to go mia mia from uh the phone for about three days which is probably going to be super uh super nice and needed but dude we're winding down uh guiding slowing down quite a bit just for the winter and uh kind of how the lake's fishing and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit and then uh we're just pre- you there bud mm-hmm. i'm still here you could pitch you, you, if you want to if you want to uh Drop out and come back in. We could do that as well. All right. Sorry, everyone. Let's try that. Groovy. So then while, while he's doing that, I'm going to be <clears throat> getting some more of the news that we were going to be talking about later on in the show. So this past weekend, we were at the Veterans Day tournament at Lake Anna, Virginia, which is the, I think it's the largest Veterans Day tournament that actually takes place in Virginia. We They drew over. Uh, almost 150 boats at Lake Anna. I think it was 146, if I am not mistaken, which is an absolutely crazy number of boats that they had on Lake Anna. I was actually fortunate and blessed to be able to fish with Matt of SB Fishing. Matt, thank you so much for um, you know coming on the boat with me. I had a lot of fun. We actually finished, I think it was um, 51st, if I am not mistaken. I think we, we finished up 51st, which honestly, for my first time, I have not fished Lake Anna from a boat in like six years. It's insane how long it's been. I fished a kayak tournament there two years ago for Northern Virginia Kayak Association. Um, I don't really count that because it is a little different than a boat tournament. I didn't have a, a, a torpedo or anything, and I kind of just like dropped in at the upper portion of the lake and kind of went from there. But that tournament was absolutely amazing. Um, and it really kind of proves the, the point that you can actually have a BFL caliber event on that lake. I know a lot of people were saying like, there's no way it could be done. The marinas aren't big enough to hold all the boats. We had almost 150 boats. That's that's almost like a BFL pole uh, around here. So the idea that that lake couldn't hold it because of the marine size, I, I think that was kind of blown out of the water with that event. Um, you know, huge shout out to, to uh, Mart- Martin. That was an absolutely fantastic event that you put on. Really, really good. Um, and if you guys didn't know, this is his last year of putting on that event. So Larry Martin, congratulations on putting on such a fantastic event. It was really good. And we're sorry to see you go. He's going to be passing the torch off to another organization next year. And hopefully that we can help out with that. The, I think it took like 22 pounds, if I am not mistaken, 22 pounds to win that event, um, which is remarkable for this time of year. 
The weights did drop off a little bit, believe it or not. I think it dropped down all the way to, oh man, I think it was like the top to get to, to break the top 10. If you had 12 to 13 pounds, you were doing all right. And you would have been okay in that event. So regardless of that, because of the time of year too, I think people are going to be saying like it was the boating pressure. I mean, potentially it was, it possibly could have been the boating pressure that did something to do with it. But I really think it was the time of year that really kind of created that issue. Uh, and then I had my last event of the year uh, yesterday for the Antietam Bassmasters. We were up at a uh, big slack and good God, does that place fish like the Ohio river? Uh, I came in the third place in that bad boy with five pounds. It was insane. Um, but what was fun is that was like the best Demiki rig bite I've ever been on in my life. Um, you were literally taking, I took the, um, what I like to use for my Demiki rig is I'll take the, the TRD finesse and I'll use that as my Demiki rig bait. I like the size profile of it, especially for those small mouth that are feeding on the really small, um, bait fish that are up there. And dude, the bite was terrible. It was bad. Cause it was like 48 degree water level, like 48 degrees was the water temp on Sunday. Um, but I think it took eight pounds to win up there anyway. So overall I finished the year out really good. Another third place. I think, I think 80% of the tournaments I fished this year, I was in the top 10, top 15. So really pleased with that. Uh, but I'll be doing a breakdown of everything that I did in those tournaments during our Patreon live stream on Thursday. And then, Oh, we got Billy back in the house. Let's try this take two. So are you there? Oh, oh, you look clear too. All right. The image looks way clear. Okay. I downloaded Firefox. Um, so let's try that. All right, let's try this. So I, I believe you left off with wedding stuff and then you're going on sabbatical for a couple of days. Got it. Yeah, so we're, we're doing a baby moon um, if for anybody that doesn't know what that is or it's a new thing or whatever. But basically, we're just going to disconnect for three days. Uh, no phones. Um, think like honeymoon before your baby comes. Hmm, nice. So, yeah, we're going to go do that for a couple of days and come back. And we got a tournament on, uh, tournament on Sunday and... Uh, couple guide trips before before the tournament and just a couple weddings left and then the baby room set up and i'm rocking and rolling just working on training the new puppy and keeping the garage organized so it's that time of year and are, are there any big tournaments um w while you were gone we were talking that uh they had the veterans day tournament at lake Anna's past weekend that i got to fish and they had almost 150 boat draw for that thing it was amazing wow but and the weights were like it was like 23 pounds to win the damn thing still for that place which i thought was incredible but it was that fall transition to winter time and you could read if a quarter was on heads or tails in 30 feet of water it was insanely clear and i know that's some stuff that we want to want to get to today as well yeah it's um it's been a weird fall for anybody that's in virginia um uh, again i think i've said this on this podcast before but i say it in life all the time you want to make a lot of money and not really have to do your job just become a weatherman or a weather woman because the computers don't know what the hell is going on and i don't think uh the aztecs knew what was going on or anything because it's been i'm in flip-flops today um and i had my sims bibs on but i just had a sweatshirt on i was in shorts and a t-shirt five days ago and then three days before that i was in a full-on suit with winter gloves and a winter hat so if we're confused and we have two different seasons of clothes in the closet then you know the fish are all over the map, uh, which is what we're running into at Smith Mountain. And then on top of that, we have not had rain or any substantial amount of rain. I'm just going to spit out 30 days. Um, so Smith Mountain, um, Thomas, I'm going to text you some pictures. I don't know if you can bring them up on that computer or not, but I went out today and yeah, kind of same thing. We're not 30 foot clear, but we're definitely in that like 10, 12, 14 maybe on the lower end like i'm seeing what's on the bottom on the last dock posts on some of the docks that mm. uh, i haven't seen the bottom before um and then we're we're really low we're 792 uh almost 792 flat which is two and a half feet below full pool here which is a lot um so it's been a it's been a weird fall it's been one where you know my Minnesota roots are going to come out in this podcast a lot because we're going to talk about line size and downsizing everything and maybe trying some different baits because you cannot really give them a lot of time to take a look at a bait. Otherwise, they're just going to peel right off. Um, so let's, let's get into it. And then one, one question I did have for you before, before you sent me or while you're sending the pictures, is this the worst drought this time of year you can remember? Yes. And I was just talking to a buddy who's a fireman this morning, too, and and 
um, he was talking about how his fire department's doing fine as far as what they're managing or whatever, but a lot of fire departments are having major issues with random fires. I think one of the tournament directors for the cat, um, is a like forestry firefighter and there was a big fire in Madison County. He had to go for a week and it's still not out. So it's, it's really dry, man. Um, for any of the guys that deer hunt and stuff, I'm sure they're dealing with walking through dry leaves and, and all that sort of stuff. And I don't know that it's really been affecting the deer hunting. Cause I'm seeing some dudes catch some tank or not catch, shoot some straight up hammer deer right now, but, um, it's definitely, it's definitely been messing with the fishing a little bit. I I hundred percent agree on that too. Um, yeah, I mean, so guys, what I'll do when he sends me the photos, I'll, I'll put them up on the screen here, but, um, yeah, I mean, where did you want to start? Did you want to start with? Yeah, let's talk. Well, so I didn't hear you, but it sounded like you said you were fishing someplace like the Ohio river. That sounds like a blast. Uh, the upper Potomac at big slack, which is one of the biggest um, impoundments that you don't know of in Maryland that you can actually fire a big engine up. And so think of, a river that has been raised up by about 30 feet, but it's still the river. It's just swollen. And so it, you're basically main, you're just main part of the river and you're Demiki rigging or Ned rigging smallmouth, except they're not six pounds. They're a pound and a half. Yum. Yum. That and super it fun. sucked. I got third place out of all the boats there with five pounds. Like that's how brutal mm -hmm. it was. Yeah, um, that, that sounds but, terrible. Yeah. 48 degree water level, 48 mm -hmm. degrees. It sucked. <laughs> I'd yeah. rather be where you're at. But um, yeah, I, I think some of the techniques that you might be talking about, like it was, it was the best Amiki rig bite I've ever been on with yeah. those. Guys. No one else was doing that. Everyone else was Ned rigging and just doing the tube deal and stuff. And yeah. I got on with the Ned rig, which, uh, but using it as Miki style. And it, it was a lot of fun. Oh yeah. That sounds awesome. Also, yeah. before we go forward, I just want to compliment this sick goatee you have going, bro. Oh uh, yeah. No shave November, baby. Plus it's the wife looking, wanted it. And I said, this is the looking, time. It's do looking it. good, dude. I would just, when November's done, shave the sides, dude, just leave it. Yeah. I always thought it looked a little mangy. Like I look like a pedophile that has an ice cream truck. So I never did it before, but you, you know, that windowless taco truck. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Selling, selling, uh, fishing tackle. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'd be so good at luring 30 year old men into the back of that thing. If I did that here, yeah, we, we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to talk offline to, uh, about my facial hair. No, no, about uh, <laughs> a couple of the, I, I was streaming uh, some YouTube stuff uh, today about a couple of the tournament guys talking about MLF and all that sort of stuff. I know you and me like to catch up on that stuff. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The drama is insane. It's, and pretty, it's pretty funny. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we can talk about that picture in a little bit, but for anybody that's on the live stream looking, that's uh, Parkway Marina. Normally, you're not supposed to see the bottom as well. That floating dock to the top right is supposed to be almost up to the top of that uh, retaining wall. So you guys can see right there, we're definitely down minimum. We're down two feet, maybe closer to three feet. Um, but I'm seeing 10, 12 plus feet um, pretty much everywhere. I've ran up the rivers looking for any sort of stain, any sort of incoming silt. On a windy day, it's, it's fishing somewhat okay back to what it is. Um, but on a slick, calm day where it's still 65 degrees, 75 degrees, it's, it's, it's being a grinder for sure, which isn't bad. It's just a different type of fishing and you just have to mentally prepare for that. So, um, fall transition, let's, let's just start there. It's going to be a later fall transition this year, um, on the weather side, but we need to remember that fish, yes, they care about the weather, but they also run on light a lot more um and moon phase and all that sort of stuff so um i try not to get locked into like what am i experiencing when it comes to the weather i want to really keep an open mind on how far along are they or how far behind behind they are and kind of trying to keep on um keep on with them um based on on those transitions and the clear water comes into play a lot with that because they're, it's not going to be your typical fall this year with bait balls in the back of pocket, stained water, chucking a spinner bait, chucking a square bill. Um, you're going to have to probably go to a Demiki a lot sooner than you normally would uh, in the past four years for me, at least in Virginia. So, I, I think one thing before we get in the fall transition, which is really interesting, is is we always talk about fish that are, are, are clear water and what happens when you get that influx of dirty, silty water and it gets muddy. Um, 
If you go from a, a regular visibility to ultra clear, what effect does that have on the fish? I mean, is it different than if you go out to, you know, some place in California that's always gin clear where they're used to it? Yeah. So uh, clear water is relative, right? So I would say at Smith Mountain, you're talking about eight or 10 foot clear is pretty normal um, for a much majority part of the year. But 10 to 14 is is not so there is going to be a transition time on days where um it is going to take them two three four days to get conditioned to those to that clear water um it's less of a light switch when stained water shows up because mm -hmm. obviously we're going you know on a, on a heavy rain you can go from clear water to stained in 24 hours so hold on a second these dogs are barking like crazy bro go downstairs now that is interesting because you always know going from clear to dirty, but not from clear to ultra clear and how that actually affects them. Yeah. 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 So the, the biggest thing that everyone should note running into the, the ultra clear stuff is it's just going to become a tough, it's just become a tougher bite. So even downsizing online, which is exactly what you want to do. Um, it's more about, treble hook size and light wire hooks and the color of your bait, the profile. This is a good time to maybe play with colors a lot on like a cloudy day. You want to go with something that's a little bit more dull versus shiny because they're going to get the best look that they've had all year at your bait. And they're already pressured from the entire year of fishing. Um, so you really want to keep those, those kind of things in mind. Um, they're just, it's really, 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 finicky on match the hatch and, um, you know, moon phase, they're going to go more towards crawdad versus shad. Like the fall to winter transition is, is a funny time because this is the time of year when you, sh it should feel like you should be able to go down from 12 rods on the deck to like seven or five. Like you're throwing a crankbait, you're throwing a jig, you're throwing a jerk bait. Top water's kind of fading away based on the water temperature. Um, and it should just be basically, are they eating shad or are they eating crawdads? The bluegill deal bite, that's not really a thing. Um, and so you really just kind of pick between those two. And then I, I rely heavily on the moon phase part of that. So if you get closer to that moon or that full moon phase, you're going to be switching to more, you know, rock crawler, wiggle wart, um, brown crawfish style crankbaits and throwing jigs, micro jigs, shaky heads, um, th those types of craw baits. And then as we get away from that full moon, you'll see them switch back over to more of a shad deal. So chasing the shad in the ditches out on the main lake points. Um, vertically fishing is going to come in just quicker this year um, because from what I have seen, even just I went out today for a couple hours. If anybody saw on Instagram, I mean, I'm, I was way offshore when I caught that four pound smallmouth. I was in like 50 feet already. Um, not saying that you can't catch them shallow because one of the guys last Sunday wanted in eight to 12 feet thrown a shaky head and had mm -hmm. 22 pounds, but the tournament weights are going low twenties to like 16, 15, 13, 13, 12, 10, and then everyone's catching 10 pounds um, because it's just really, really tough to put in five good ones. Um, two good ones, more realistic, three good ones on a windy day, great. But I don't really see it Smith, unfortunately, this uh, winter unless we get some sort of weird cold snap and it pours and snows. Um, I don't think we're going to see 27 to 30 pound bags like we have the last couple falls. C compared to the winter time in a month and a half, how long are you spending on fish that you're seeing versus, you know, like I said, like in the winter? You mean like on live scope fish? Yeah. Um, I'm moving around quicker. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you go to a point and, and they're still schooled, it's super strange, man. They're still schooled together in bigger schools than what they are in the winter. Like the winter time you're seeing like, three, four together on a point and they're bigs, right? You know, you're talking they're four pound class fish, but I'm going to points right now and I'm still seeing like September schools where it's like 15 to 17 together, but they're all two and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost out there fishing like September with water clarity and bait size that you have to match. 
but the bigger ones aren't as up shallow as um, as they should be for mid November. I mean, what are we talking about? Today's the thirteenth. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you look at the extended forecast, which is which is strange too. Um, I don't think we're under sixty degree highs for like ten more days. So it's going to be kind of this uh, extended, kind of dull, non-pressure um, dropping. Um, another, you know, we're talking Thanksgiving time at that point. So we might not really get into true, true winter fishing into December. And I've only lived here four years, so maybe this is totally normal. Um, and you're really not getting out of that winter bite stuff until December. But um, it's definitely, it's definitely been a weird one. And like you said, Anna's crazy clear and. Um, and you've kind of got a, a fluctuation to that. So, but jumping back into kind of the, the transition side and, and this right now is specific to Smith mountain, but I've talked to a few different guys at, at bugs and some of the North Carolinas and, and stuff like that. And we're all kind of dealing with the same thing. The water's super clear. It's lower than it usually is, um, is specifically if you are coming to Smith, let's say Thanksgiving's coming up, you're coming down in the next week and a half. I would say it's a really good idea to cover like an 80 20 type of scenario where you probably got 80% of the fish or so. Yeah. 80% of the fish and about like 20% of, am I saying that right? Uh, you said like 20, like 20% of the water has 80% of the fish yes. and then 80% yeah. of the water doesn't have yeah. anything. Yeah. Something like that. Math was uh, not a strong point for me. Um, so essentially what you have is you have a majority of fish on Smith that are secondaries making their way back out from the early fall transition. We did have a really good solid, like two and a half, three weeks of buzz bait, shallow crankbait, spinner bait, um, little swim baits, chatter bait, stuff like that. It didn't last as long as I think most guys would have hoped, but we did have a good solid, we'll call it three weeks of, of run to the backs of pockets, hit as many backs pockets as you can. Um, but then like the light switch, it did just start switching from them transitioning out. And that was that first big cold snap that we got where I was wearing, you know, the full Sims gear, winter hat, winter gloves, like actually cold hand warmers in the, in the suit. We did have a stretch of about five days where it was definitely in the thirties at night. So that transition has happened, but there are still a select few, um, bigger pockets. So bigger main creeks, Becky, Betty's, Gills, um, Bull Run, kind of the, the the standard spots at Smith Mountain that hold bait almost 12 months out of the year. There's still bait in the back there. There's still big ones back there. You're just running into that water clarity issue of maybe they're rolling on your buzz bait, not really getting it, um, biting the tail off your swim bait, like kind of that annoying stuff where it's, it's really frustrating to run back there because you know it's probably a big one that's eating the bait. So... That's where we're at at Smith currently. If you are coming, say like Thanksgiving, early December, do your do your dance to the ice queens or whatever you have to do. If we could get four or five nights in the high twenties to low thirties, I think that would be enough of a shock to the system. To all of a sudden, you're talking about secondary point and main lake fish are going from two and a half to fours. Hmm. Uh, I think they're there. It's just a matter of you got to catch them on the right day. And like I said, those slick calm days where you're talking one to three mile an hour wind, it's just, uh, it's slimy, man. It's, it's put your head down and drag super slow and super light line and, and, um, take your time trying to count rocks and hit as much structure as you can. It's crazy. Cause, and just this coincides with tournament fishing. And I heard this, this past weekend, you know, more and more tournament organizations, cat example, we're having tournaments now, but if you go back 10, 15 years ago, I don't really think that ever happened where you had tournaments this time of year. Nope. So it is new territory for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, if you look at cats, I mean, they've, okay, let's say I've done three years of the fall of cats. Um, BFLs are out. You, you're done with BFLs at this time of year. And I get it. I get it's the deer hunting season. And a lot of the fishing guys are just outdoorsmen and that's who you're kind of catering to. But I would so love to see elite events this time of year and like the real, you know, real hammers, um, try to go when it's this just slimy grinders, man, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to see kind of what tricks and, and how they're breaking down water and looking for, uh, looking for fish. The pandemic was interesting where I think you had Cooper, Santa Cooper in the fall, Lake Chickamauga in the fall. And then I think Lake Fork 
was late November when Patrick Walters, like what, like 200 pounds, some asinine thing he did. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. But it was interesting that guys that are good at like leg Shikamagua sucked because it was yeah. in the fall. And it's just, that's all he had to do is change the season up. Yeah. 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 It's definitely, it's definitely a, a hard time. I mean, we, I almost felt like we dealt with like almost like a double turnover. Like it was definitely like the water got gross and grimy, looked like Diet Coke. Like it was definitely gross. And then it kind of went away quick um, with that cold snap. But then we had another six or seven days in the 80s and this water skyrocketed back up to almost 70 degrees. And it was like it reactivated uh, the water and kind of that um, that hard hard kind of bubbly, gross water, leaf decay um, kind of grossness and then um, transitioned kind of into this. So I feel like I'm talking super negative about it and that it's a super like grinder fest out there, which it, it's just a different way to approach um, approach the fishing. And I, I will say it is going to get better. Um, we just really need that cold snap. And so paying attention to your weather, I would tell you guys too, um, for example, just with today, they're, they're basically on shad pretty hard is paying attention to your three days before on your weather and a couple days before you go out can be really key this time of year because they're still eating the small forage that was born this year or born last year that's only three inches long. And those, those minnows that are schooled together, if there's three days in a row of a uh, seven to 10 mile an hour sustained wind and gusts up to 15, whatever pockets are getting blown into, um, any sort of pockets that get sun for most of the day right now, those bait are running to those pockets about midday to get that last bit of warmth. Um, that's another, you kind of do a reversal of springtime versus fall time, right? So in the springtime, Fish are going to run to banks that are north wind protected that are getting most of the sun because that's the first water to warm up. Same thing in the fall. The shady banks are going to get colder first. So that bait's going to run back into those shady or sorry, into those sunny pockets. Um, they don't do it in the morning because everything's a new world level playing field every morning. But as that day progresses, if you have a bright bluebird sky, low wind, you will find those bait balls at like two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock before that sun gets really low, taking that last little bit of heat in um, on north protected and and um, north facing um, pockets. In, in the year 2023, with lo every brand has live scope and we have so much technology, how much do you play into watching birds, seagulls, um, comorants, things like that? Yep. That's funny. I just, I should try to see if this text message pulls up. Let me see if it's got any info in here about uh, where I was fishing today with Will, but um, here we go. Let me screenshot it. Hold on. I don't know if this will show up or not. Is it pretty good about exposing, right? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Tons of uh, how deep? No, nope. <laughs> tons of seagulls. <laughs> All right, so you gotta you gotta keep the old school stuff in your head. I know the electronics are awesome, and you could stare at live scope and basically run your boat into the bank if you don't pay attention and you don't look up. Um, but keeping tradition and like your gut intuition going. I was up one of the rivers coming back basically at dusk and turn the corner going back to, to parkway. And there was about 200 seagulls just sitting in the middle of the lake. So that's a dead indicator that there's bait that's high in the water column. Um, and it, you don't have to stray very far from where those birds are to figure out where they're at. Cause they're not going to go, they're not going to swim down to Craddock to enjoy the view and then fly up to the bridge to eat chat up there. Like they, are a dead indicator that there's bait and they're a dead indicator that the bait's higher in the column. So keep that in mind as you run down the lake, blue herring are still around. Um, loons are starting to show up at Smith mountain. Maybe I'm a Minnesota boy. Like I love seeing the loons and like trying to talk to them and whistle to them and all that sort of stuff. But loons are a really good indicator to like, yeah, at least this is how I view it of like bigger bait. I think people forget how big loons are. They're actually a pretty big bird. And they can dive very deep and stay underwater for a long time. I don't know that they're 
they're obviously keying in on whatever they can get, but I wouldn't be surprised if a loon targets a four inch blueback as opposed to a two inch thread thin and four feet of water. Like they're I, probably out diving for the deeper, bigger stuff. I saw one on my live scope unpracticed last week for like Anna. Oh, yeah. I was like, Jesus, God, they, those fuckers can go deep. I didn't realize they, I, those I things can stay under water for more than 10 minutes. If I'd have to go, that's like Minnesota question. I, I'd have to look it up again because I probably maybe am making that up, but I'm pretty sure they can stay under water for multiple minutes. Um, and they can dive like 40 feet. So, yeah. And if you saw it on live scope, dude, I mean, they're like penguins. Like, yeah. They're, they're going, they're not messing around under there. So, yeah, birds. Your your herring are going to tell you kind of what's around up on the shallow side, but loons and seagulls are a great indicator of offshore bait. Um, and keep an eye out too on the loons. Obviously, your seagulls are going to come up and dive, and, and that stuff's pretty basic. But keep an eye on if your loons are just swimming through the water, or are they actively diving? And loons are a group bird, so it's not usually going to be like one loon. It's going to be like four to seven of them. And if you see all of them diving, there is a hundred percent. There's a bait ball under the under those birds. Um, hmm. and just kind of keeping that, keeping that in your head. So, um, the only other thing with transition, um, that we could talk about Thomas, I don't know if it's a possibility to bring up a map or if you want me to bring up a map on my side, we can talk about like what to look for. What, what type? Uh, what? you can just bring up Navionics or Navionics is fine. So as you're, as you're bringing that up and, and we can work on transitioning to the bait stuff too. Cause I, no joke, I probably have 20 baits on this kitchen table, um, is the fish are moving out to their winter stuff, but do not get ahead of those fish. There's a lot of times where if the bait is enough bait, they're not going to leave that stuff until late December, January, until they crush everything that's back in the bait. So, what I mentioned on, for example, some of the bigger creeks that have bait left over, Gills Creek, Bull Run, Becky Betty's, Campers, like just kind of generic um, pockets that are full of bait is we refer to these things as the ditch or I call them like the scoop um, is you visualize a back pocket that would have had bait, say, when the weather or the water temperature was like 65 to 69. The big flat, there's going to be this like first scoop of a dredge or a ditch where as the water is cooling at night, the bait is going to go from being up in that shallow section to sitting in that first drop right at the back of a pocket. So if you can take the time and spend the time to find those and, and find bass with the bait, that is a type of spot that's going to be good for the next two months. Um, it's, it's just where they're going to stay. That's an ambush spot. It's a comfortability thing where those fish can transition back to deep water if they want to quickly. So if we get like a crazy cold snap, they're not sitting in that eight to 12 foot range. They can go out to 25 and suspend. Um, but that is a great fall to winter transition is finding that first ditch that's got bait on it. Um, and has bass very close by because it's something that will reload and, um, is that's kind of like i would say your fall to winter honey hole is going to be a back ditch that's got fish on it so um you can zoom in on on um right on those thomas and we can kind of talk like what you guys are looking for so for anybody that's not familiar with uh topography your wider lines are going to be a shallower taper or a slower gradual uh fall into the depth your tighter lines are going to be really really steep drops and so the one that Thomas has pulled up here right in the middle um, is what we would consider to be a fall bait holding type of contour. What that is, is there's probably in the back of that area there, there's probably 40 yards of a very similar water depth, probably like two to five feet. It's probably some stumps back in there, some laydowns on the bank, and the bait is going to use that for warmth um and just kind of getting out of being crushed by stripers out on the main lake and what's going to happen now is those bass that were up super shallow with them are going to be right in that first little scoop if you scoot if you zoom in thomas you can like roll the mouse over it i guess but this scoop right here on the right guys um kind of looks like a tongue <laughs> um 
it's a weird one that you decided to go yeah, with. Little, little tongue to the side. Um, that is where you're going to have your play of a small swim bait. A jerk bait is going to be almost clutch. Um, big glide bait this time of year into that. Um, maybe drop shot with a longer leader line. But that's what you guys are looking for to find those last shallower bass. So like I said, going back to the 80-20, most, most of your bass are going to be on secondary, like pretty hard secondary points or main lake points. But at Smith specifically, you take the time to graph and look for those types of areas. That's where you're going to see your three to five big, big fish that are up just finishing, um, finishing off those bait balls and those bait schools. So keep an eye on your electronics, um, look around quite a bit. If you do in the fall get a heavy rain, so let's say we get three inches of rain next week, um, those are also going to be phenomenal spots because those are the first areas that are going to get stained. You're going to have water coming down from the mountains or coming down from the steeper parts in the back of the pockets that's going to stain those back areas. And now all of a sudden going from, hey, you got to keep the boat at 150 feet on live scope to even see if there's a fish up there, you can just go fishing. Um, and not have to worry about, you know, they're going to be a lot more aggressive. Um, they're going to be roaming around a little bit more. They'll, they'll search out that click of the jerk bait. Um, they'll search out that click of the glide bait and, and be a lot more aggressive than, than what they have been the last couple of weeks. So that would be a, a key thing with the fall transition into winter. Once we get into that, like mid 50 degree weather, I would tell you probably not, uh, not weather mid 50 degree water temperature that bite's pretty much done. That bait's decided, all right, it's not getting warm enough for us to chill. We're just going to go suspend out over points. So we're at 61 degrees right now on my Garmin, which on a Lowrance is like 63. So we still, in my opinion, we still have probably 25 days, 30 days of, of that being a potential bite. When do you start looking for the tighter contour lines? Started today just out of trying to keep an open mind. Um, but I don't like, I don't feel like I have to do that until low fifties. I feel like there's still enough that are on those transition line spots for like a crankbait, like a wiggle wart or, um, or you can still catch them kind of like suspended on a swim bait. For me, the vertical wall stuff's like January. And that's when I'm doing stuff like tight lining, blade bait, um, a rig, maybe weighting your jerk baits down, um, kind of those more sneaky things. Cause Smith's, although we have really good, um, kind of contours in the lake, the steep, steep, steep vertical stuff, we really only have like six or seven true bluff walls at Smith mountain, um, that are like, you know, the boats in 60 feet right at the bank. Because if, if I was a guy that has never been to Smith before and I looked at this map, it looks like the creek on the left. I mean, you look at some of those docks, those contour lines are pretty tight. That looks like a wintering area versus the creek on the right, as you've stated, is more of like that fall transition. Yeah, um, so break it down on what's going to happen in the next 30 days is you're going to have fish that are probably still eating bait for the next, we'll call it two weeks. Let's say we get a cold snap. So they're going to run out onto that secondary point. That's going to be your good transition time for chucking a jerk bait fluke um something on those suspended fish because they're still in they're still in active eating mode and then what they'll do is they'll swim over to those docks and that's going to be kind of like a wintering spot that's going to be something where they can hang on the dock posts they're going to get a lot of sun on that side of that bank um just to kind of stay warm and then that's where you're talking yeah if the dock's got a 25 foot dock post on it maybe you're throwing a spoon down the side of it or a Demiki rig or, or something like that so I don't think we're there just yet, but that's the exact transition that I would think of as well by the time we're talking Christmas. And I, I'm also glad you mentioned this because this is a question I get a lot of times too. Um, just because you're looking for bait, it doesn't mean you're only specifically fishing the bait ball. It's when right. you find the bait, it's that generic area around it that, that will also play. I don't really start fishing the bait ball until it gets colder when the bass are like in it you can see it on you know take take live scope out of it i wouldn't fish in the bait ball until till january um that's when i find them to be like 
So I, 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 the term I use is a void. So on live scope, it's super easy and you can see it on 2D as well. But when you go over uh, a ball of bait and you can see that the bait is getting the hell out of the way of something that's underneath them um, or inside the bait ball, that's a dead indicator to me of a blade bait, a spoon, a uh, Damiki axe, a hair jig, um, something that you're dropping super fast into that void. Um, and you can do it with an A-scope on your 2D sonar also. You just look for your arches and your returns. Um, but with live scope, that's what makes live scope super fun in the winter is you can find a bait ball in 50 feet that's over a treetop and see three bass that are literally just like, they're not even eating the bait. They're just in the middle of the bait and they just create a dark circle um, mm. in the middle. And you can flick a Demiki over there, flick a spoon and drop it literally right into where that void is and get bites pretty much all day long when you're talking about those depths in the winter. That's really cool. That's really cool. And then guys, you know, as always, um, Jake's bait and tackle, you're going to be winning gift cards uh, for asking really good questions. I haven't forgotten about you. So drop your questions now and I'll make sure they get answered as we continue here. Uh, there's this really cool question by Brandon, which is, let me get up here. Are boat shadows an issue with clear water? That's actually an interesting question. That is an interesting question. I, I would say I would, Originally would have said no, but I have had some weird experiences this year where I've had schools follow my bait back and you would think that they would just disperse when they see the boat where I've watched them on live scope, like stay under my boat for like multiple minutes. Hmm. And, and I'm talking like you're out offshore, say in August, chasing schoolers with like a top water to where you get six or seven bass to come in and you're in 50 feet casting up to a point in 10. And you watch four pounders follow your bait. And then all of a sudden they're literally under the boat, like 10 feet under the boat and just don't go anywhere. Um, so I would say I'm like out, like I'm dead neutral with it. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I have this discussion with some guys all the time on like the crazy boat wraps and like sparkle versus dull boat wraps and all that sort of stuff. Um, they this time of year and to answer your question about clear water i would lean more towards yes yeah on a bright sunny day no wind with less stain your boat shadow could be going down all the way to 14 feet of water um and they're seeing just a giant dark blob come um but i also don't and i'm not a fish i wouldn't say that shade is making fish be weary they love shade like that's part of they're like biology to ambush out of shade all the time. Um, but I definitely think they, I definitely think they know you're there. Once they see the boat, they, they know you're there. And the bigger ones, I will say that the bigger ones know it's the boat. Like you're not going to get a bunch of chances on jerkbait fish, schooling fish or, or anything like that, that, that see the boat. You got to leave those fish and come back. Now, another question that we have for a Patreon supporter, he wasn't able to make the show. Remember, guys, all Patreon supporters get their questions answered is how do you how do you triangulate and stay on offshore cover without forward facing sonar? And I asked him specifically if it was just forward facing sonar or any electronics. He said specifically without forward facing sonar. OK, um, landmarks. So boats are frictionless. You will you are moving. Every single time you look down and look up, you have moved inches away from where you were just at. It's just part of the deal. I think once you get your sea legs, like you just kind of forget that. Um, live scope obviously helps with that. But what I would tell him to do, which I have a trip on Friday where I'm jumping in a client's boat. He does not have front facing sonar and he wants to go striper and crappie fishing. Well, when we go crappie fishing, I'm bringing out two buoys for when we graph over on 2d and show him what a brush pile looks like that we're going to use buoys as reference points um reference points to that so how i liked to do it in the past was i would specifically look for something on the bank in front of me and behind me um, and then i would throw a buoy 10 12 15 feet to the left or right um, of where i was casting so this time of year is a good time to do it with the fall colors that are changing because it's nice to reference like, hey, okay, I'm lined up with the red changing tree in the background and this, this specific dock behind me um, and kind of use that as a 
triangulation um, of figuring that out. And then also what I would do is I would make a mental note or I would even put it in my phone of, okay, I went over that pile. The top of that pile comes up to eight feet because I don't want to, without front forward facing sonar, I don't want to throw, let's say a Demiki rig. Well, if it's a three quarter ounce Demiki head, I only need to count two seconds before I need to start working that bait back because I know the tip of it's in eight feet. I didn't go, okay, well that brush piles in 21 feet. Um, so I would make mental notes of like, okay, it's a two count and you're aiming at the red tree. That's just how you kind of do it. And then unfortunately you just got to kind of risk it without front facing as far as how close you are and you're going to want to fan cast. So if you go red tree, you're going to go three feet to the right, three feet to the left, six feet, six feet until you feel like you're really getting an exact bearing of, of where that is a good tournament to watch like past tournament with that is Polinick. I don't remember where he won, but he was deep cranking a bunch of brush piles. He specifically <laughs> thought, um, this was years ago, dude, this had to be probably six or seven years ago. I don't remember. I don't remember where that was, but, um, he was talking about triangul triangulating with landmarks on, on the shore, but yeah, that's how I did it. Um, and we'll still do it to this day. I mean, Live scope's extremely accurate, but sometimes I'm turning live scope, but actually not sometimes, a lot of times I am turning live scope away. Um, Will and I talked about it with tournament fishing a lot and I'm at 120 feet. I haven't gone below 120 feet in probably four months. So I am making some serious long casts. Um, and then I am turning the live scope to the sides every time after I cast. I'm really glad you brought that up because I saw this on the upper Potomac and maybe because it's like, it's an old river. So it's really hard bomb small mouth, but the bigger ones, when I was Demiki rigging, it couldn't be underneath the boat, even though it was in like 25 or 30 feet of water, mm -hmm. they would come off the bottom and then would spook. I'd have to do it away. And earlier in the year when I was getting them on um, a spy bait, they get between like 70 feet and it's just almost like they hit a wall and they just turn and their body language completely changes. And it has got to be. It has to be. Yep. It has to be. Um, yeah, I've been turning it away. Um, so I've been going back to a little bit of like, okay, I know just from where live scopes lined up that I am aiming for say the red tree on the bank and I'm just, you know, if it's suspended fish, it's, it, you really don't need live scope for suspended fish. The only time I really am leaving it on the piece of structure is if I'm chucking a jig into a brush pile or I'm chucking a drop shot or a Ned rig or a shaky head or something like that into the brush. And I want to make sure it gets into the brush. But if I scan a point at 120 feet, 150 feet, and there's six bats that are in eight feet, I just sling whatever bait I'm throwing with live scope facing right and making sure I'm not off that much. And I turn it to the side and just back to normal fishing. Um, and it seems to me like it's helping maybe. Um, I mean, that smallmouth that I caught today was 401 on the scale. I saw her on live scope and turned live scope away and made my cast and she bit on like the fifth twitch. So I, I really thought that question was interesting that my Patreon support brought up because I, if you told me like triangulating with live scope, I'd be like the, the most important piece of gear I got in college was the point one antenna from Lawrence mm -hmm. and, and and Garmin now I think has like steady cast and yep. Yep. it's so cheap and no one talks about how important it is to make sure that your 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 puck antenna is good because that thing will line you up dead nuts on the thing every time but it automatically devolves into forward facing sonar bad. Yep. Yeah. The other thing too with with fall transition into winter, let's say you know, let's say we get a big rush of fish going up to the bank here because we get a big heavy rain and stuff like that. I don't even turn live scope on. If I'm going to go crank for the day because it's blowing 25 miles an hour. I'm not even turning it on. Um, or if I'm going to go chuck a jig on shallow rock, like I don't need to see on live scope if there's fish on a six foot deep rock pile. I'm making five casts on it and I'm moving on. So this time of year is like a 50 50 of if I'm going to turn live scope on or not. Um, and yeah, just in just in general, I mean, think you and me are coming up on a year doing the podcast and stuff like that. I mean, I've progressively added 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet to, to live scope. And I've definitely gotten into the habit of turning it away. So mm. that's interesting to see what this happens in any other year or two, because everyone has it now. Yep. So For they're sure. smart. They really are smart. I mean, dude, it'd be, 
I love offshore fishing and I love technology, but I also love my back and my ankle and my neck. And if it ended up where everyone got live scope and I told John Cruz this like two years ago, I think it is going to push a ton of fish shallow. God, I would love it if you could just go back to just beating the hell out of the bank and catching 25 pounds. Yeah. It always balances out. It really does. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I really want to get into, and this is a great, this segue here, Greg, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. <clears throat> Again, if you guys would like to uh, win something, just ask a question. Uh, Billy, could you comment on your rod and reel tackle setup and baits at this time of year? Which, one of, which one of the 25 that are sitting in the boat? Um, <laughs> all right, Greg, I don't know if I can answer that in one question. Um, I'll just tell you in general on rods, my friend, I have been with Dobbins for five years coming on six. Um, I have a, big series on my YouTube of what rods I'm using, like just a real high level, like three, four rods of what I'm using um, at each specific time of year, each month. So you can check out that YouTube uh, to get maybe a little bit more specific, but Dobbins rods are fantastic. They have multiple different series of, of rods from your basic super entry level to $550, $600 ecstasy rods um, that are crazy sensitive and extremely well-made. So, um, that is the rods that I use reels. I've been a Shimano guy my whole life since I was a child. I don't use anything else. So depending on what your budget is, if you're an entry level spinning reel guy, uh, nasty 3000 is a fantastic reel. That's what I use for guiding. I never have problems out of them. If you want to get up into maybe the mid range or more expensive, you can go with a Vanford or a Stella. Um, and then a Shimano DC is very hard to beat especially this time of year, any sort of like digital breaking um, reel is going to be important for slinging your smaller baits, like your smaller jerk baits, your wiggle warts, your, your lighter crank baits um, to really help get it when it's windy too. You want to have something that's got a little bit more of assistance on the breaking stuff because backlashing when they're chewing is the worst possible thing that could happen, um, especially having to deal with it in the boat. So Sh Shimano, Cronarchs, Corrado Ks, um, that's kind of their workhorses. If you want to get into the heavy stuff, you can buy metaniums and try not to scratch them and resell them later. So um, that is Rods and Reels. Sunline is um, a sponsor as well that I use. Sunline Sniper, probably 80% of um, my line is Sniper. One that I'm going to talk about specifically is 7-pound Sniper. So what you want to get into is line diameter is extremely important to look at when you're looking at line and the Japanese companies. So your, um, your J braids, your Invis X, your sniper, um, your assassin, all of the Japanese lines are going to have smaller or the smallest diameter line for the pound test. Um, I'm sure Berkeley and Trilene and, and all those guys are not, they're probably the same at this point, but one of the biggest staples for Japanese line when it first came out was the line diameter for the pound test. So not a lot of companies offer seven pound line. And if you feel like you're crappie fishing with four to six, but eight feels like a rope in these conditions, then seven is like an awesome, awesome line to, uh, to use as a leader. Have you seen, have you tried their new product that kind of takes away from fly fishing where the knot size is like 12, 15 and it tapers down? Yep. I have not tried it yet. Um, but one thing that I will be trying it with is Carolina rigs because I hate Carolina rigs. And one of the reasons I do is I feel like I can never find the right line test from say, like do you go 20 to 16, do you go 16 to 12? Is one supposed to be mono? Like kind of this like whole dilemma to it, where if you're telling me I can tie a leader on that's 20 pound test on the end that I tie to the swivel and then it goes down to 12 then, and I don't, and I have that just in that leader line as opposed to a, the connection knot piece, then maybe I wouldn't hate the Carolina rig as much. Hmm. Um, so no, that's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept as far as, um, as far as that it, it's, I feel like it will have its place for sure, but I've not tried it. I've heard a lot about the FG knot lately. Like it actually has weaker tensile strength than other knots when you, depending on how you actually tie it and how much strain you put into it, especially when you're dealing with seven, eight or, you know, lower pound test. Yep. Yep. 
I don't know, dude. I try, I tie the crazy Alberto. I was just saying in the boat today, like, man, I got to really work on the FG just because going down to five pound line and um, even from eight pound braid to five pound line, the diameter is pretty substantially different um, is I wrapped 12 times just to be sure, but it's, it's catching a lot, even with the, the light line diameter. So going with the FG, but then I just get terrified that, I mean, the FG is just going to slip because five pound line is like less than floss mm -hmm. um, as far as the diameter. So I'm going to be playing around with that a little bit more. Five pound line is, uh, is crazy um in my opinion and it does feel like crappie fishing but it is going to get uh it is going to get you more bites so um but going to baits is there any other question you want me to answer or should i just start jumping into baits roll for it roll it. all right um let's start with what we've talked about a bunch let's just start with the minky fishing so actually let's not because that's going to be more <laughs> like sorry sorry guys that's going to be more <laughs> Your, that's going to be your late fall, like definitely more into winter. So let's, let's talk about what's basically going to happen here in the next 10 days. So we're still in that mid, like low 60 range, maybe mid 60, like 63. If, if we get a hot day, there's still a little bit of top water going on. Um, they're missing the top water a lot. So I'm, I'm putting it away. Um, but it's still there a little bit, but you don't want to transition from a super aggressive bite, like a chatter bait or a trap or a top water to, okay, I'm going to go throw a five pound line with a one inch Demiki bait, tight lining a vertical wall. You just don't want to skip that far ahead. It may feel like that's how far ahead they are, but I guarantee you they're not that far ahead. So what I like to do with what we referenced earlier is, is check those ditches checking those things first thing in the morning, because that's where that bait is pulled back out. The number one thing I'm going to use, uh, hands down 85, 90% of the time is a jerk bait. So they're still really aggressive. The bait is still there. It's just dropped down a little bit. The only thing that you need to play with on your jerk bait and you do need to play with it. So don't get lazy this time of year is color and size depth you need to figure out how deep they are on those drops but for me specifically greg for example i have four jerk bait rods that are on the deck and they all have different jerk baits on them and different line sizes so that if i go to a ditch that drops down and it's 17 feet and they're down to the bottom that i can throw a plus two and get it down 14 feet to get their attention where the next pocket i go to it might only be a transition from five feet to eight feet and i need to throw like a darter that's only going two feet under the surface. So if you have the ability to have it, I would try to have at a minimum two jerk bait rods out. I would have a shallow running jerk bait and I would have a one of the deeper running jerk baits. So the main ones that I am using, this should be no surprise to anyone. And I will say I have tried every jerk bait that's ever been made. I love jerk bait fishing. I would say it's a strength um, is mega bass. They have they have it figured out the weight transfer system makes casting these things super easy their color schemes are all dope they come out with color schemes all the time um i'm not trying to just say go buy the most expensive one most of the jerk baits are good jerk baits but mega bass just has it so dialed that it's just pretty stupid to not have a bunch of these in your boat so with that i i did a little bit of uh instagram story stuff with, with um kind of some of the baits that I picked up from Mega Bass. Staple, number one that everybody should have in their boat, 110. I don't know what else to say that hasn't been said on the internet a thousand million, bajillion, bajillion times. Um, this is, in my opinion, the best jerk bait that's on the market, has been on the market for years. So get yourself some 110s. They come in different varieties for depths. But this is kind of just an all around start with a 110 in your hand. It's a big fish bait. It's also a limit fish um, type of bait. But get yourself a couple shad colors, get yourself a couple maybe unique colors that they, they have. Um, and we'll jump into small mouths a little bit. But putting 110s in the boat is super obvious. The one that I would jump from that, and, and this is where I have usually my setup with with let's say i have two jerk bait rods on is i'm going to have a plus two on 10 or eight pound line i can get that jerk bait down to 14 feet it's a big profile jerk bait that's going to tell me if those bigger ones down there want to eat something big or not 
the other one that I'm going to have is going to be split between two different jerk baits. The first one is just going to be a 110 junior. So it's just a shorter bait. This is a plus one. Um, it's just going to be a smaller profile bait. It, don't make this hard on yourself. They're going to want one or the other or one of these other jerk baits. All you have to do is just play with the size until they tell you what they want. But they're eating jerk baits this time of year. It's just a staple. Um, it's just like throwing a shaky head in this or a Senko in the spring. Like it should be in your head that it's that generic of a or that textbook of a of a bait. So 110 plus one is on my other rod. If this is too big, then I'm going to kind of the smaller ones that Mega Bass provide. This is a darter, so it's a two hook. And I know some guys are anti two hook jerk baits, but hopefully you guys can tell just from the size of this thing, this is just like a chicken nugget. This is just a morsel of a meal for a fish. It's got a fatter or sorry, a taller profile. So it's gonna look like a bulkier meal for, for some of these fish it's called darter for a reason. It's got a little bit different of a bill. It's got a little bit of like a scoop in the middle right here. This thing is insanely erratic. So if you're talking about, you know, a windier day in the fall transitioning, you want sporadic as you can get. This is the one to go to because um, this thing is whipping around like crazy. The other two, and these are ones that I just started messing with this fall, but I already made a massive order, um, is the Nanaham. So when we get into very clear conditions, really having to match the hatch, really making sure that you're you're around the same bait size. Um, I, this thing has just been super dope. For anybody that's on Instagram, I cracked a couple good ones with it. Um, I've been fishing with it a lot. This one's already rashed up. They have this in a plus two bill. Um, that's Mega Bass's plus two bill. I am fishing this on a spinning rod with seven pound sniper, and I'm getting this thing down 14 to 16 feet. That's not weighted hooks. That's nothing. So you could wrap lead wire on these and you could get this little jerk bait probably down to 20 feet, which is insane. Um, and that's going to be a huge player here in the next probably couple of weeks when they pull out from that shallow flat stuff we talked about into those ditches as they progressively go out deeper. If you can get a jerk bait down into 20 feet, um, those fish are going to crush it. They just don't see jerk, that many jerk baits. There just aren't that many jerk baits on the market that can get 20 feet deep. So we're going to go down a rabbit hole real quick. Um, yeah. With shallow jerk bait, I, I, I'm very crazy with how many colors I have. Yep. The deeper you go, are you more like a deep diving crankbait where it's like a couple of colors and that's it versus a shallow crankbait where you can have 32 flavors of the sun? Like, what is your breakdown of colors? Yeah, I keep it pretty basic once I'm 15 feet deep. I just don't think light penetration. Well, I shouldn't say keep it super basic. Did I ever send you that video that I saw on Instagram that was like some kid put all these highlighter colors on a hanger with a GoPro and dropped yeah. it down? So it's not that you lose color, you, you lose vibrance. So I would pay more attention to flash versus not. Um, or muted colors versus not because especially in these water conditions this thing at 15 feet has enough flash on it that they're still seeing flash they're probably not seeing the vibrant purple and like kind of that like i don't know whatever that paint job is that looks like it should be on like a chrysler 300 but um <laughs> whatever that paint job is where it's like a holographic i think they're still seeing that flash down that deep um, but no, it's not going to be, it's not going to be as much shallow where it's like, okay, they're six feet deep and they can see, they can see everything. So I will piggyback on your comment on color because we're going to talk about smallmouth a little bit too. I started cracking them a little bit today and they're around. Um, smallmouth hate this. I don't know what it is about smallies and chartreuse and purple and a little bit of orange right there on the belly. Um, this is a great color. Um, I've got full chartreuse ones. I've got strawberry colored ones. I've got crazy wacky, you know, um, elegy bone chartreuse on the bottom, clear in the middle, like smallmouth hate bright colors and they are vision eaters. So if there is a plus side to this water being this clear is if you can get out there on even a little bit of a breeze on Smith's um on the lower end mid end halfway up the rivers right now and there's smallies around 
if there's a little bit of a breeze, they are not messing around. Um, I had two that T bone these jerk baits today that I had to like do surgery to get them out of their face or mm. out of their throats. So have those colors and this this would be the time of year and the situation where if you don't feel comfortable throwing the weird ones that you bought um at bass pro or you want to try these weird colors this this is the time to do it for the next four weeks do you change the hooks out at all i do um so i change them to gamagatsu nanos uh, nano trebles for the most part, or just like a Gamagatsu round bend. Um, it seems like on the spinning rod, I didn't change them out on the Nana hand just out of pure laziness. Um, it seemed like on the spinning rod, I didn't really have issues with bend outs or anything like that, but I'm throwing it on a seven, six spinning rod. So it's just, I mean, dude, it's got five guides of tip. Like the whole thing just bends. It's such a wiggle stick that it's like, okay. Because your hooks are bending out because you don't have the right rod. You're over leveraging the rod to the size of the wire of the hook. Um, so maybe to, ant to go back to Greg's question super quick on rod, guys. Each company, no matter who you go with, should have a general um, description on each rod of like their speciality. So Dobbins has two or three jerkbait rods that are specifically tapered for jerkbait fishing. They have a 6104 which is their jerkbait special. I throw my shallower ones on a 684 and then a 704 CB. Um, those are the staple jerkbait rods that they, have, that they have that are designed for you to not bend out hooks on jerkbaits. Um, the 684 feels like a piece of a reed. Like it's the most wiggle stick rod I have in all of my rod arsenal, but you can get a bite on that thing and bend that thing into almost a full C and, uh, and those fish won't come on button. So Dang, that's freaking crazy. When it comes to retrieve, um, the jerk bait one, I get asked a lot about too. I probably do. And yep. it, it's such a weird question to ask, I guess in my mind, cause it's like you just change it up until they eat it. But yep. Yep. is there a more nuanced way to approach it? Or is that pretty much the right answer? Generally faster now, going into slower and when we say slow and and i'm sure thomas you and me will get on in january or whatever and we can talk slow is like 30 seconds between your pauses and i have had to fish them that slow fast is five jerks and a millisecond pause four jerks three jerks five jerks and the nice thing with live scope if you hate it or you don't one of the things that makes it awesome is you can find out in about three points how fast you need to work a jerk bait for them to react to it correctly as opposed to if you don't you're just going down the bank until you figure it out so it might take you an extra hour to figure out how fast the jerk bait needs to be where live scope you're watching their biology and you're watching their body language right away and they're telling you slow it down um get it deeper like that you will see that from live scope right away so um generally yeah start faster this time of year and sometimes guys on a on a windier day right now with the water still being mid 60 but them chasing a jerk bait and eating it you don't even need to stop it you literally work it as fast as you humanly can and they will crush it that they're I, I deal with this with guide clients sometimes i'm like how fast or slow they work a bait like if they're really not new to fishing and a lot of comments are well, how do they catch up to it or how do they get it? And it's like, no, your human eye can't even see how fast they're moving. Um, they will be able to get your jerk bait. Even if you are reeling and twitching at the same time, as fast as you literally can on your shoulder, they will come up and crush it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent there. Um, and, and the one thing I, I even realized with scope this year, sometimes you put too much slack in your line between pauses. And I realized that where they were just hitting that thing so freaking light and it was because i had so much slack in between where yep. and i was doing a small mouth where if i would twitch but almost keep my line tight in between i could feel that mush of them yep. actually yep. having it in their mouth but this is just a pro of having forward facing sonar where if i didn't have it i would think like yeah no jerk bait i'm gonna move away for something else so here's the number one tip that i give clients that that come for jerk bait trips now and in the spring i bet you i catch eight out of 10 jerk bait fish that follow my jerk bait now, as opposed to when I first got live scope or didn't have live scope. If you have, let's say you have three fish on a point and you throw your jerk bait, two of them come up, one stays down. The two take turns 
I guess I'll have to do it this way. The two <laughs> big turns coming at the return of your jerk bait. If your jerk bait and the fish connect and it looks like that fish is basically laying on top of your return of your jerk bait, set the hook. I have caught so many more fish here, top of the head, under the under the mouth. Those fish have that jerk bait way more often than we think they don't. We just don't feel it because you're putting that second pause. There's too much slack. They're closing their mouth on the jerk bait. And as soon as you go to pull, they're just opening. And so for me, what I'm doing a lot with the jerk bait is if I can get them close enough to it where it looks like they're basically laying on top of it, I'm catching way more jerk bait fish than I have in the past. Um, the last two years, I've just been doing that very methodically with um, setting the hook when I don't feel any pressure. I don't feel a line jump. I don't feel mush. I don't feel anything. I just set the hook when the return shows like that and I'm catching a lot more fish. And then we have our, our next person that just asked a really good question. Uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Shackle. Uh, J.R. Uh, Mitchell, uh, number five hooks. Are yes. Are you using your bait? Yep. Yep. Number fives, um, number fives and number sixes um, if I want to go down even smaller. So yep. what's your next thing you got for us? And and then uh, wh while Billy's getting the next bait for all the winners that just won tonight, just email me, fishingdmb at gmail.com, Instagram, Facebook, get a hold of me and I'll get you that card. Cool. All right, so next couple baits that are going to deal with that ditch situation, and then we're going to transition to kind of the rock stuff, is swim baits. So especially with clearer water, too, you got to get away from big baits like chatter bait. Um, you could probably still throw a trap, but again, I'm trying to get away maybe from like really obvious, big, loud type of baits and trying to go a little bit more subtle with, with the clear water that we have. Again, this is another mega bass deal. You can throw whatever swim bait head you want. You can throw a straight ball head for all I care. That's totally awesome. But at the same time, when we're pressured this late into the year, you do want to try to change it up a little bit. And so we're talking about this Okashira head. It's just something different. It's something that they don't see a lot. A lot of guys aren't going to go spend the extra money for this. It's got a good heel to it, which is important on a swim bait head. Um, because when you're reeling slow in the fall, you want to have that little side to side, um, because as those minnows are swimming, they're not swimming straight like this and they're not swimming wide, wide. They're just swimming really tight shimmer like this. And so a nice keeled swim bait like that head is going to provide that the blade is going to be a little bit of a flash. So maybe you're going with the blade on the Oak Shira when you're throwing during like blazing sun type day, cause you're getting a little bit of water movement and you're getting a little bit of that sun flash. Um, and then go with just kind of the regular one without the blade. They're just really well made. They're good detailed. The hooks are crazy sharp. Um, you can do it on a, you, you can literally throw whatever you had. Dobbins has a great jig head that I throw all the time, but if you're talking about little swim baits, um, this is just the high tech easy shiner. Three inch um, spark shads are good. Anything that's in that like three inch range um, is what you're going to want to do. I would tell you start transitioning away from Kai Tech. Um, the Fat Swim and Impact is meant to be a big tail movement, a really big water disturbance. And as that water gets colder, you want to continuously work down on a tighter wobble to match what the bait's doing so that your stuff's not super obvious that it's a bait. So for example, that Kai Tech um, Easy Shiner, you guys can see, it's just a skinny profiled bait. So this on six pound line is just finesse to the max. So, I mean, it, it's basically a, a, a spy bait without treble hooks. The yep. same action is the way I look at it. Yep, same action. Um, so that's a solid way, or that's a, that's a good um, transition spot in those drops. And then also you just have different weight sizes. So you could have a heavier head on throughout those on those deeper ones, or you could have a light one me this time of year um and as we transition into winter you're going to want to continuously get that bait down 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 but this time of year you do want to keep these up high in the column for example that we were talking about the seagulls bass and stripers are pushing the bait up seagulls are pushing the bait down it's this constant nature battle of like where's the bait going to end up so most of the bait is mid column or higher so it's not natural for you to be throwing this and dragging it down on the bottom when the bass are looking up they're looking up this time of year. They want to chase the bait down. They're, they're aggressive. They're putting the feed bag on. If you see schoolers out there, suspended fish, 
always have this above their head, never below them. You're going to rarely get bites if you're reeling through them and underneath them. Um, piggybacking with that, um, going into kind of like crank-ish um, type of deal, this is going to be something for both that transition ditch also to vertical fishing, but that's a Damiki vault. People refer to these as blade baits. This is pretty old school. Silver buddy is like what our grandpa's through literally just like ironed out or like slammed down some iron and added some weight. Like, again, doesn't need to be a super fancy one, like a, like a vault. Um, it can be your silver buddy, but the has got some cool colors on this. These come in a lot of different sizes, but this is your variation to say like a rattle trap different vibration sound. It's not bead vibration. It's just bait vibration. Um, it's heavier for the most part. And it's something that you can vertically fish and just reel through. So for me, excuse me, I'm doing three quarter ounce ones for the most part, because I want to get down to where those fish are as fast as possible. But this is a bait that's going to be on the boat basically from now through fe February. Um, and just depending on where the bait is and if those bass are in those void balls versus that ditch, um, this would be one. So this is kind of a crankbait. Um, but then I will transition over to the crankbait stuff. There's really only two crankbaits styles that I'm going to have on the boat for the next two months. Um, and for anybody that's local and knows me, I would say this is probably my favorite way to fish. I feel like it's probably my number one strength besides offshore stuff. And that is throwing a wiggle board. So this is midwest minnesota river fishing lake of the ozarks like straight up midwest staple type of bait um why you should have this one on is what's referred to as hunting action if anyone has seen a crawdad or watched a video of a crawdad on youtube they swim backwards they swim very erratic and very fast um, but what hunting action is, is it is referring to how far out the bait is swinging when it deflects off of stuff or when it is reeled in. And so the wiggle wart, the rock crawler, um, just crankbaits that kind of have this rounded body shape, um, are going to have the best hunting action on top of that. Things that I like to do on the wiggle warts, um, is I change out the split rings that they have for black split rings because i'm weird on my wiggle warts and i feel like if they get a flash of silver maybe that pulls that fish off of chasing that down i take the ring off of where your bill tie is uh, i change the hooks to again those gamagatu nano hooks because that's a dull colored hook and then i actually tie my wiggle warts with a loop knot so what a loop knot is, and I'll show you guys when we're going to talk about the Damiki, and I doubt this will show up, but a loop knot is, um, does that show up maybe? Kind of. Your skin's as white as your shirt. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so a loop knot, my friends, is essentially a fly fishing knot. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So a loop knot is a fly fishing knot that provides a free swing to a bait. And so the reason that you tie a loop knot on wiggle warts is it's going to exaggerate the movement even more. And when I say loop knot, I'm not talking about you need to tie like a three, four inch loop knot. I'm talking about just do like a one inch, two inch type of um, type of loop knot to it. But those are my modifications on a wiggle wart is change your hooks, dole everything out. If you want to color these things up, I'll show you guys a custom painted one. It is literally just lawn shavings and a dirty diaper. So any sort of just kind of gross muted um, type of bait is super important. Play with your colors a little bit as far as like maybe a hues of blue, purple, splash of orange. I don't really throw a ton of like really, really orange uh, wiggle warts, maybe in the spring a little bit, but what you have to remember on the crawdad stuff is they are burrowing in the rocks in the winter. 
we're turning the corner where it's going to get cold enough that these crawdads have to burrow um, to, I don't know if they actively hibernate or if they just need to burrow in the rocks for warmth, but what is happening with the wiggle warp bite is those crawdads are up in those rocks, scurrying around in the boulders on your windier days out here, the bigger fish are coming up because those crawdads, if it's 20 mile an hour wind beating into a rock bank, those crawdads are literally just like, like if you, if you can imagine yourself in the ocean, even being a 190 pound dude, you can't keep your feet in the same spot. It's the same thing with, with, um, prey type of, of deal in, in lakes. And so the wiggle wart is fantastic to imitate that. The other side of the spectrum from fall going into winter is the shad are going to go from being very erratic to very calm is the wrong word. But when they swim around, it's it's a lot less frantic and it's a lot tighter. And so one that I have really liked is the frit side. It's a nice bait that's weighted on the bottom, so it makes casting it super, super well. This bait is not designed to be burned in. This bait is meant to be slowly reeled in to bang into rocks, bang off of stumps, dock posts, all that sort of stuff. But the reason you guys want to have this in your arsenal, also similar to that swim bait, you can see... Any sort of flat side that's like this, it's going to create a very tight wobble to where when the bait's moving through the water, it's literally just moving about that much. And it's just enough flash to match what the minnows are doing through the water um, and, and match the hatch. So this is an important transition that you do not want to miss when you go from cranking to round bodied shad style crankbaits to flat sided. You want to make sure that these are in here. The other one that you're going to want to throw is a shad wrap. Again, that's as tried, as tried and true as a Senko. Pick yourself up some five, sevens, and nines, throw it on a spinning rod, and and throw that thing around when that water temp starts to dip into the 50s because um, that's that's the style that uh, is going to get bit the most. Am I keeping rolling or we got any more questions? Uh, we have hella, hella uh, questions. We got hella questions. Uh, 2.8 is life. Um, <laughs> Hey, Rich. Scott, Scott Bowers, uh, I bought a good amount. Just let him know. Awesome. Uh, Billy, what tournaments are you looking to fish in 2024? You're, you're going to try out for the elites, right? Yeah, dude. It's just a phone call away. It sounds like I just need 150 grand to burn. <laughs> um, so I will fish the BFLs again. Um, I think I'm just going to cherry pick Smith, maybe jump in one at Kerr. We don't have nearly as many weddings booked, but I'm going to have a one-year-old child or not even a one-year-old child. Um, so a couple BFLs, cats, um, maybe I thought about jumping in a uh, big bass if it's like Norman or I, I guess that schedule is out. I could take a look. Um, maybe just to like give myself a vacation and jump into something kind of, kind of different and unique. Um, but probably just sticking close, close for next year, see what happens with the kiddo and, uh, maybe win a little bit of cash if I can here. Brew tank. Billy is the man caught him in September on vacation with his help. The lake is awesome. Caught a PB yellow perch over two pounds. Wasn't trying. Um, he also says definitely booking a trip next year. I know yeah, Big D yeah. it's all uh Big D TV went down with his dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that was uh yeah, that was awesome. It was fun to see his dad. His dad was a hardcore cat fisherman and like pond fisherman. So to have me have him like cast like a bunch of different lures, he's just like every fifth cast, he's like, Am I doing this right? Is this right? Am I doing this? Is this the right speed? And I'm like, just trust the product, just trust the journey, brother. Trust the journey. Trust the journey. Um, but yeah, he, he had a, he had a good time. So yeah, it was, it was good to get them back down here. And, um, yeah, I will say on him talking about the ring perch, I don't know if he caught that in Smith mountain or not, but dude, I have been catching a ton of yellow perch in here and they're not small. Like Minnesota, dude, if you caught like a 12 inch perch, you're like, it's one, it's going in the skillet, but two, you're like, okay, that's like a, that's like a full grown one. Dude, I caught a 16 inch perch like a month ago. Wow. Um, and I had a couple brush piles. It, they're gone now, but I had a couple brush piles in like 18, 20 feet that I thought were crappie. And I went back with like uh, my like little crappie setups, jigs and little blade baits that I have for crappies and wailed on some like 13 to 16 inch ring perch. That's um, insane. And it's got me thinking there's got to be bass eating them. 
oh, yeah. there's a population that big there's there's yearling perch in here and and there's there's more in here than we think um so i may or may not have picked up a bunch of uh, mega bass perch jerk baits I mean, you say that that's another reason i think white plays is because of crappie not just shad um because again, you have that crappie spawn, and you know it's not just—I I don't know—that just dawned on me last I mean, this this past spring, where I had a, a bass that coughed up a crappie, like this yep. massive five plus incher. Um, they they still eat them. 100%. They still eat them. Most of the fish that you're catching around brush, I would tell you, are probably eating crappie or bluegills. Um, you know, if it's obvious there's a shad ball there, great. But if you pull up on a brush pile and there's four or five little fish swimming around and one big one, that thing's down there eating crappies or, or eating something like that. So good stuff. Good stuff. Well, let's keep the ball rolling here. Yeah. Um, next page. And then guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything we, we talked about today. Okay. So let me talk about the crawdads one more time, just kind of like a different variation of baits. And then we're going to go into like, okay, this is what you guys are going to want to start doing as we transition like Christmas time and on. So another staple bait in the fall is a shaky head, especially with the clearing water like this. Um, it's one you should have on your deck pretty much 12 months out of the year. For me, I do transition away from shaky heading a worm for the most part to shaky heading a craw. And that again goes back to the fact that we're getting close to that hibernation time for crawdads. So that's where I'm going to switch to something like this bait profile. So <laughs> nice little compact craw bait. This is a missile bait warlock head. Um, and one thing I'll tell you guys on the warlock head that they just updated that's really nice. But this right here is the chunky D. Missile came out with it last year, comes in a nice clamshell, but it's just a super nice, compact, cross-style bait. Um, you're throwing this on a spinning rod, you're throwing this normally, I would say, on 10 or 12-pound line, but I'm down to 7-pound line on my shaky head right now. Um, but this is green pumpkin, super bug's a good color, straightforward fishing. It catches fish, it catches bigs. This is about the size of, of what I would say the crawdad are running around this or smaller. Um, and it's just a nice compact bait uh, that works really well. The warlock head comes through rock really, really well. Good Gamagatsu hook. But the main thing that I would say, and this is like a huge pet peeve of mine on shaky heads, is if it's a twist head like that, it needs to have this point. If it doesn't have this point, it's super annoying to put a bait on with just a spiral. Your bait almost never goes on straight. It comes out the side, like as you're twisting a worm up, all of a sudden your bait's like halfway out the side on it. So having that extra pin missile just updated the Warlock head, so now all of them have it, is it gives you a good starting point for that bait um, to where it's going to thread on there perfect every time. And you're not burning plastics just to try to get it on there really nice. So shaky head would be kind of the other thing I would say that's just like the jerk bait fishing. I have two shaky heads usually on the deck and all I'm doing is two different sizes. I'm usually just doing a quarter and I'm doing an eighth. Um, just so I've got that heavy fall rate versus something that's super light because Fall rate can be important this time of year with the watercolor. Also, if they are really, really negative eating, you kind of have to drop something in their face super, super fast and don't give them too much time to look at it. So that is one of the plastics that I would be throwing. The other one is, I would tell you right now, most dudes are going to say, hell no, I'm never doing that. You're an idiot for showing me that. I don't even know why you would do that, is a micro jig. Hmm. relative to my hand this thing is tiny so this is a missile baits micro football head trimmed up modified a little bit this is a little um mini d-bomb as the trailer but this you know it's got a tiny little tiny little hook to it you guys can see that so this in my opinion is one of the most ultra finesse things that you can be throwing any time of year um i have one on smith mountain with the non-football head version that was almost six pounds on a this tiny tiny little baby bait and that other one's even smaller than that so as you're transitioning um from fall to winter bait size is super important like we talked about especially in clear water they're getting a good look for all you know a lot of the crawdads down there aren't as big as this chunky d 
and they want something more in that size range. And that can be a difference between getting bites and not. So the other thing that I would do um, as well is if you guys do buy packs, you can pull weed guards and you can pull shirts off. So you can either customize this yourself or you can turn this into just be just actual plastic on it. So this would be a situation where you just modify that, um, that baby D bomb, just make it, you know, a, a very small little craw, you know, you're talking like a Ned, Ned bait type of size, but you're getting a heavy weight out of that football head, um, crazy sharp Gamagatsu hook and ultra finesse. So you're talking, I'm throwing this on like six or seven pound line. Um, seven two rods seven four rods something like that but that that right there seems like a lot of guys would probably question it but i can tell you guys right now like it's it will catch you a lot of fish this time of year and it has no problem catching some giant ones when do you make the train now are you making the transition completely with your jig fishing to just that micro one right now um and and then you got hella, hella bass again the chance like you guys are super serious yeah it's my medication it kind of makes me that way yeah um, i'm dead tired what, what do you want to talk about rich yeah, let us know. Um, yeah, I just think it's interesting about the whole jig thing because there is a transition that happens, I think, twice a year when it comes to your size. And, I mean, the guys up where I'm at on the Shenandoah and the Potomac, we're throwing hair jigs, like these micro custom tied things for smallies. So I, yep. I completely understand what you're talking about. Yep. Um, no, I'm not transitioning fully over to a micro yet. Um I'm still throwing like a smaller head banger. I'm just trimming skirts a lot. So I'm not doing like a big, big skirt. I'm, I'm flaring it out quite a bit and then I'm downsizing my trailers. So that, that's another thing for anybody that, that um, cares for Smith Mountain. If you go read my fishing report, this is the time of year where we want to transition, especially when you're fishing a jig out deeper. Cause you guys got to remember if it's 61 degree water at the surface, if you're throwing a jig in 25 feet, it's 50 some degrees down there. You want to get away from like your grub style of jig trailer, something that's going to flap a ton when you move it to something a lot more subtle, excuse me, like a D bomb or like a zoom chunk or, or, or something like that. That's just kind of a single flat flapper. Um, that's, that's something that I'm doing on kind of my regular jig is, um, calming it down quite a bit. Good stuff. Good stuff. And then guys, we got one more gift card to, to give away from Jake Spate and Tackle. So drop your question here in the comment section down below. And we'll get that answer as we're wrapping up here. Cool. Um, let's go into the vertical style of fishing or the, your, your bluff wall stuff. So like we talked about, they're going from the ditches out to the secondaries, going to the tighter contour lines, um, or specifically at Smith Mountain. There are a ton of treetops in this lake. It's ridiculous. It's also overwhelming. You basically have a, a whole second lake, in my opinion, during the winter from what's around the bank, even out to say like 15 feet to all of a sudden you could go fish treetops in 70 feet of water and those treetops come up to 30. So it's like you have a whole nother lake to go approach. Um, take your time graphing, find the biggest, bushiest tree you can out of that row of trees find them on good transition spots and, and good kind of contour lines. But this is probably one of my new most favorite ways to fish after live scope came out. And that is a Demiki rig. Um, it is just fun to send something down into the deep abyss and have one slowly swim over to it. And just, I, I feel like when I watch it on live scope, like they're literally just like, yeah, like they're just kind of like falling into it. It's never really like a whole oh, hell yeah type of bite. It's literally like, nope, I'm so into, so cold down here and dark. And this could be something in front of my mouth that I'm just going to slowly swim up to it and slowly like suck it back in. Um, and I have caught some monster fish out deep um, starting Christmas time through February. So the Mickey rig. Again, going the finesse style, guys. You guys can see this is a VMC Moon Eye. I have custom Demiki heads made. I have ball heads. I have darter heads. Um, the head isn't necessarily as important as the bait, in my opinion. So this is a Demiki Armor Shad. And for what you guys can see, hopefully against my skin or whatever, 
this thing barely moves. Um, even me just kind of like moving it and then stopping it, the tail moves for a split second. You don't need to Demiki rig with anything that's this big S wave type of bait. You're talking, you want subtle, you want something that's very manageable um, that you can see on live scope. Um, that's why I kind of use like a bigger style head. I also do like the actual eye on this bait. I do think if you're talking, this water is as clear and it's a bright sunny day and you shoot this thing down to 25 feet, maybe they get enough of a view to where they're seeing that eyeball. Um, but you're talking light line, vertical fishing. I tie a loop knot on my Demiki rig just to see if on the way down, I can get any bites from it kind of shimmering a little bit better than just a straight knot. So having that side to side, but this is quickly becoming one of my favorite ways to, to fish in the winter um, on slight calm days when it's super, super tough. And, you know, you could go throw a football jig or, or something like that. I'm very, very fond of this little guy. So that is the Miki Armor Shad. Um, it comes in a bunch of different colors, different sizes. They have a three, they have a 2.5, um, Z2s. Um, there's a ton of different companies that, that have the Miki stuff at this point. One that I will kind of piggyback off of you, a TRD is not a bad choice. It's very subtle movement. There's really nothing going on, but it still fits the same profile um, of, of what that bait should look like. And then another one that I throw a lot of, which is quote unquote not supposed to be utilized, is missile baits has their Ned Bomb. This is a great Chad profile. What you can also do to give this thing even a little bit more subtle action is you can actually take a pair of scissors and cut straight down the middle of this and give it a fork tail. Um, but it, it's, again, a little three inch morsel. You can rig it either vertical on the tail or horizontal. Both are gonna be just fine, but it's all about just basically rigging it, keeping it super straight on your bait like that. And that's that's all the Miki fishing is. There's nothing crazy to it. Keep it as simple as you can um, with your bait choices, but that's another great little minnow style of bait um, to do the Demiki stuff. And then the only other bait that I really brought is what you're going to transition from once it gets cold enough here, pray to God, there should be in the late winter um, or later fall transitioning into winter is we should get what's called a shad stun, which is going to be when these small shad, which they're getting decimated right now, um, a lot of bass, a lot of stripers, perch are eating them, crappies are eating them. Everything is basically eating that yearly size bait is eventually you're going to start going the opposite direction with your baits, which is bigger baits. They're going to run out of food that's that small. And so what you're going to go to is more in this like four or five inch um, style of swim bait. So I throw a ton of spark shads. I throw a ton of um, suicide shads, anything that's in that kind of um, swim bait that's more of just a mold, um, whale from six cents, something that looks a little bit more beefy um, than just say like the, than just say this um, skinny shad profile. Um, so ball head, triangle head, some sort of swim bait head transitioning um, into that. And then the only other like two baits that I brought that were sneaky, um, so I had a couple buddies say, hey, tonight, can you drop some sneaky stuff? This is something that I used to do in Minnesota a lot, and I catch a lot of fish here, is you get into kind of your weird Japanese baits. This is a Kitech leech. So <laughs> super weird profile bait. Doesn't it looks like something like from adamandeve.com. <laughs> yeah. It does. It looks like candles. Um, so it doesn't even look like the bait's connected. I'll grab. I'll grab one out for you guys. But just a weird profile bait this time of year with how clear this water is. I think would be a good idea. So if you are into tackle or like being a tackle junkie, go to JapanTackle.com. Look around the plastics. Find something weird. Hook up tackle. I mean, Tackle Warehouse has these things now and stuff like that. But having something that's just a little bit more unique um can be can be killer this time of year so you'd be doing like an octopus hook with this on a drop shot um and just kind of swimming that thing around that is goofy as hell but i mean people you know, catch you know what a kyle looks like 
It kind of looks like maybe what your sperm would look like. They missed a golden marketing opportunity with that. <laughs> How's that, Rich, for we're too serious? There's something there's something interesting about like going with the sneaky base and adjusting it. And I think that's what the Demiki rig has really done because you do need live scope to make that really work well. Yep. Um, like, what do you do when the fish... What I saw, and this is something I'm, I, I don't have the experience that you do with it. When they rise up to it and they leave, how long do you give that fish where you bug out like you would anything else and go find a new new set of fish? If they bug out, then I'm gone. If right they, up, right down. Yeah, if they bug out and go back down away, this is how I've done better on Demiki fishing. No movement. Like send it down to them, send it 10 feet in front of them, drop it down to where they, you can tell on live scope, they sense something is coming down and then I don't move it. And then I'm doing the same thing. I shouldn't say don't move it. I'm doing a very similar thing to what I explained on the jerk bait fishing, that if I see that fish come over and the returns go on top of one another, literally all I am doing is like ice fishing bro like the littlest flick i mean that thing's moving a quarter inch up and that's when you'll feel them crunch down on it um and so for me i'm not really moving my demi i'm not doing this with my demiki and moving it up and down and stuff like this i'm shooting it down and i'm holding it completely still maybe every once in a while maybe i'm doing tiny bit of this but very very subtle movements um and once they come to it and they're right on top of it on the return. I'm just giving it one more little snap. And that's, it's like, it's like a 90% bite deal. If I can get them to come over and look at it and it's like, they're smelling it. Um, I can snap it that one time and get them to bite. Speaking of smell, I do have this right in front of me too. This shouldn't be a secret, but some of you guys might think this is some sort of weird secret. Oh, uh, yeah. So, Take your Demiki baits. Don't just put gulp in there. Take whatever baits you want and dump every possible plastic you want in there to stink. But for me, Demiki fishing, having it be in the gulp for a month seems to definitely get better bites um, and convince a lot more fish. So force yourself to not be lazy, whether that's gulp alive or fill a Ziploc bag full of smelly jelly or whatever, whatever float your boat on that sinky stuff and um, just get that stuff. I would start soaking it now, honestly. And we got Bart, Bart trainer here. Um, Bart, you just won a gift card, a jigs bait and tackle. Billy, how are you fishing the Demiki rig? Slow reel vertical jigging. I think we answered part one of that question, but are you slowly reeling at vertical jigging? I'll add one more piece to that. Are you adjusting your, your forward facing sonar to the down version? So you have more view. Good question. Um, so, slowly pulling it away from them yes not a fast movement so again if one comes over to it he's sitting right at it maybe you do the ice fishing deal people do this a lot in, in ice fishing in minnesota is if you have fish come to your bait you don't let you don't snap it up super far away from them you lift it up away from them like this so it's a hinge at your elbow hinge at your shoulder you're just lifting it slowly away from them um, that is how I have had way better success than snapping it and trying to give it erratic action is just let them kind of decide that all of a sudden they just want to make the mistake and eat it vertically jigging. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm directly on top of them. Kind of like what you were talking about with your experience recently, I will get to that point, but I'm probably flipping the fish that are 25 to 40 feet out in front of in front of sonar penduluming it down to them to where when the boat moves forward it pendulums down to where i may be 10 feet in front of them um before it comes to a complete vertical vertical jigging situation and then i do not do down um i with the way i'm demiki fishing it's not a situation for me with down where like if you like i use down for like if I'm going fun fishing for stripers just with like a spoon in the winter because there's 700 of them together so it's just like okay there's your spoon like knock one in the face with the tree deal 
or like a rock, deep rock pile or something like that. I'm literally aiming for that one fish and it's just, it's really weird with down to know where your bait's at and orient to where it's going to swing down and all that stuff. It's just easier to do it on front facing. And Bart, one thing, a rookie mistake I made that you really need to keep in your mind is when you're staring at it and you're lifting, you have got to think about, you've got to stop at a certain point or you'll lift it so high. If you get bit, you have no real estate for the hook set. And yep. it's just yep. something I learned the hard way uh, yesterday you have to be subconscious about like i will only move the rod this far before i start reeling otherwise you're really screwed when you get it up there you've no way you can get a good hook into them yep 100 um also i would say this is a good kind of rod rod choice too is you want a longer spinning rod for this at least that's what i prefer i'm going like seven two to seven six um to get it away from the trolling motor number one but number two is sometimes you're you don't even really have to if you're fishing 40 50 60 feet deep you don't even really have to set the hook that hard there's so much line out there that if you're lifting up and then you start reeling and there's any pressure you can mm -hmm. just reel and those fish are they're done because a six seven six rod is going to bend over so much at that depth and vertically um that it's basically setting for you so i would honestly probably tell you if you're having to go down, like sometimes I had a Miki with five pound line, you don't want to set the hook that hard. You're just going to snap the line um, at your knot or that far down there. It's more of just kind of like building the pressure and letting the rod just kind of do it. Think like, think like crappie fishing with a 12 foot cane pole. Those guys don't really set the hook. They just lift the rod up. That's yeah. That's actually probably where it came from too, right? Like that whole yep. idea of, of crappie fishing. Um, we got two more questions, guys, as, as we wrapping this bad boy up, we have, Justin here, what's a good swim bait for your drop shot? So um, if you're going to do an octopus hook um, with just a swim bait on it, I think the profile is going to be the most important thing again. So the Kai Tech, um, something that's like a smaller profile, one that I've been playing with that's really skinny also, I just didn't grab out of the garage, is Mustad actually has swim baits um i don't know what they're called or remember what they're called but i would tell you to focus this time of year on having a really really slender profile um profile to your swim bait so um yeah has dong shad is is another good one it's it looks like a minnow um i would kind of say on the other side too with with clear water too this is where me personally i would rather have baits that have a little bit more shape to them than just a mold um, because the fish are getting, again, they're getting a crazy good look at it. So instead of throwing a ball head, maybe you throw something that's got an eyeball on it. Um, instead of throwing just a regular mold swim bait, you throw the three inch spark shad because it's got fins on the side. Um, maybe take that into account with, with how clear the water is to get your bait as close to looking like a actual piece of uh, you know food yeah that's really true i never even thought of about that you know the mercury of the water it doesn't have to look perfectly correct and i think that's where you look at like with swim bait fishing as we get there especially like with a huddleston and things like that you have to be photorealistic when that fish can inspect yep. from a mile and a half away yep 100 now we got one more question here i'm like have oh i've got scott brower here let me get this one up here um have you seen the oh my christ ozark rig okay i, I, I can read uh, have you seen the Ozark rig? It's like the hover style jig that you rig similarly to a shaky head. No, let's look it up. Ozark that looks rig. Well, that's like that, that hover rig thing that I'm trying to figure out a little bit more. The core tackle one. Yeah. The only thing I don't like is it rips the bait up, dude. Oh dude. You elastic is what you got to use basically, which I, I don't like it for everything, but you don't go through as many baits. So, so I had but fish the moment has an hour long video on the Ozark rig. Good God. <laughs> Guys, go find that out. Go to that video. Check that thing out. Uh, instead, probably a little bit more information on it. Yeah, I will definitely take a look at it and see. Um, I'm big into, um, I mean, I'm big into playing with baits and stuff. I, I like, I like messing with stuff. Um, I'm looking at it. What the heck? 
it just looks like a Texas rig. It's like a flipping hook with the weight built into the hook. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I have not seen that, Scott. Looks like an interesting concept where it's getting away from the. It's, it's getting away from. The, lines. Yeah, it looks like it's getting away from the like throwing a Texas rig with a weight. It's more just weighting the hook. So, no, that's interesting. I have not seen that, my friend, but that definitely could be uh, that definitely could be something to play with. That looks like what you would almost do with like uh, swimming a swim bait down on the bottom, so it's Texas rigged. I've seen a hook like this before. It's used a lot for fishing helgramites and things like that on creeks and stuff um, because it does. It has a gliding action versus going straight down, especially if you have the, a flat bait. And the picture I have, it has a beaver style bait, which kind of makes sense with the body design to get it to coast more. Gotcha. That, is, that is interesting. Yeah, Scott, yeah. thank you so much for showing that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, guys, I mean, Billy, I mean, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I mean, and then guys, link in the episode description to all of his social media, everything that that he he has going on in his life. Then also, guys, check us out on Patreon. We're only 55 subscribers away from hitting our first Patreon goal as we get closer and closer to creating our own nonprofit to where we can start helping out. You know, a little spoiler, we have Jason Halliker who runs a smallmouth fish hatchery in Virginia. And we're gonna be talking about that whole program and you know what we can do to help. That's coming up too. Um, what do you got going on? I mean, dude. Uh, anybody that wants to know about Smith mountain, check out the fishing report. Um, I've got links in there to, to my little bait shop deal on my website too. That's, that's got bait specific. Um, you know, if Jake's doesn't have it or, or something like that, they can go to that. And, uh, dude, I'm just going to fish as much as I can until, until the little babe comes and just kind of relax with the wife. So it's been a it's been a crazy year, man. I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do close to 175 trips. So yeah, remember when we first talked and I was like, yeah, this is gonna be like a 30 to 45 trips uh, trip type of deal. So no, this is a it's a full time job now, my friends, and wouldn't have it any other way. It's blessed. I've had some great great clients this year, some big fish, and um, it should be. It should be a good winter. So if anybody wants to learn that winter stuff, like we talked about, like Demiki fishing or really using their electronics a little bit more, now's a now's a good time to hit me up and and try to get some dates if we can get some cold weather coming up. But uh, yeah, check out the site, social media, and, and support that way. And and people need to get on your Patreon, man. We need to get more more fish in these uh, smaller waters. That's the plan. They're doing a good job right now with all the big stuff, but we need to. We really need to help out the uh, the little lakes around us as well. But uh, guys, again, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Link in the episode description again to everything we talked about. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.